All right, so this talk begins somewhat predictably about three and a half thousand years ago with something called the cardiocentric theory. The cardiocentric theory was the belief popularized by the ancient Egyptians that the heart was the single most important organ in the human body. The Egyptians believed the heart was responsible for thought, emotion, intelligence, feeling. The Egyptians thought the heart was so important, it was the only organ they actually left inside sort of the chest cavity after they'd embalmed the dead. And what would happen is the dead would sort of pass on to this, I don't know, not, not quite purgatory, but they'd go and meet up with Anubis, the god of death, who would then weigh their heart against a feather. If the heart was lighter than a feather, they made it through to Egyptian afterlife. I can't help but think ancient Egyptian heaven was very, very quiet, because if you notice, that's not just a heart weighed against a feather, it's a heart and a jar. No one's getting into Egyptian heaven, right? No one's heart plus a jar weighs less than a feather. But this is the belief. They believed it was that important. It was the only real organ that was kind of left inside the human body. Now, fast forward a thousand years. It took a thousand years before someone else came up with the idea, the suggestion, that maybe it's the brain that's most important. Maybe the brain controls feeling. Uh, Hippocrates came up with the cephalocentric theory, ceph, the prefix ceph meaning of the head. But this never really caught on. It took a thousand years before someone first brought this up, and it never caught on. No one really thought the brain was that important. Now, um, it was, uh, like I say, it was... Um, Hippocrates, who first popularized the idea, or, or sorry, came up with the idea, it wasn't until the 1500s that this guy, William Harvey, actually proved that, no, the brain is pretty important. But ironically, he didn't prove it by kind of proving the brain was important. He just worked out, no, the heart does specifically this. The heart just pumps blood. Therefore, maybe the brain does something else. But for about two and a half, three thousand years, we had no idea just how important the head was. Human anatomy was completely misunderstood. And almost all the focus was put on the heart, everything from the neck down. So I think, in my work at least, we've got a similar kind of problem. I'm a web performance engineer. I make websites faster for my clients. Nearly every developer I work with seems to subscribe to this cardiocentric theory. They completely misunderstand the importance of the head. See what I did there? Very smart. Oh, wait. My clicker's going to give me a bit of trouble, I can tell. For the next 40 minutes, you are going to learn way more than you ever thought possible about head tags, way more than you ever wanted to know. I'm completely obsessed with head tags, and I can guarantee you in about an hour, you will be as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a bunch of time looking inside our head. Now, before we do, I want to cover a couple of key concepts. Two things that are just going to, to a lot of you, they'll be really obvious, but they should make the rest of the talk just make a little more sense. Just things we need to remind ourselves of. First thing is that HTML is parsed line by line. That's an immutable fact. HTML is parsed line by line. There is no control flow. There's no logic. A parser has to step through HTML line by line. It cannot even see that line three exists until it's finished parsing line two. That's why, for example, this wouldn't work. If we were to try and console log foo, foo isn't defined yet. We can see here that on line three, we're trying to tell, you know, trying to find out what foo is. The browser hasn't even found foo. It's on line six. That's why this would throw an error. That's why this doesn't work. And if you're a developer, you'd be very used to seeing things like this. And this is a pointless example. A slightly more meaningful example might be something like this. If you want to tell a visitor what the title of a page is, you need a title element. However, if you've got anything even remotely expensive in front of that, in here, it's just another console log. The browser doesn't even know there is a title element until it's finished running that little bit of script. This is vital, and this is a key concept present in every browser. HTML is parsed line by line. <coughs> the second important thing, and this is actually kind of underpins the whole talk, really, your head is the single biggest render blocking part of your document. And this sounds really simple just when I say it out loud, but if you stop and think, the head is the single biggest render blocking part of your document. Because HTML is parsed line by line, the body tag, the opening body tag, cannot even be discovered until the closing head tag has been finished. And the body is the only thing that actually is visible to a, a sighted user, right? 
So until the head is solved, the body might as well not even exist. So what this basically means is you need to solve the head tag problem before you can even start to think about your body tags. Now, to kind of prove this point, not that I think you don't believe me, but to prove this point, here we've got a simple snippet, a style tag that's just going to turn the background of the, the page red. And also, we've got a synchronous script in the head tag. Then we've got an H1. In the page, we've simply got a title. Now, what's going to happen is we load this page, and that synchronous script is going to block for X amount of time, which means we're going to see nothing, 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 and then red background, black text. So prepare for this. It's going to happen in the blink of an eye. Nothing, 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 everything. Right? Everything appeared at the same time. If we were to simply nudge that script out of the head and into the body, this, as a, as a diff, this is barely a change, right? But simply moving that script out of the head and into the body, we can discover the opening body tag far quicker, which means that now what happens is we get a slightly better perceived performance. This is an example for example's sake, by the way. Don't start moving all your scripts out of the head. I'm just proving a point. Before, it was nothing, 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 everything. Subtle change. Watch what happens now. Simply nudging it out of the head means we can start rendering the body much sooner. We still were blocked for the title. The title still took a while to appear. But hopefully this, this simple example helps kind of drive home the point that the head is the single biggest render blocking part of your document. And that's really what you want to solve if you're going to solve anything to do with render timings, whether that's first paint, first contentful, or largest contentful. So um, for this talk, I created a baseline. I, I created the world's slowest head tags. Uh, which is a bit redundant, because all of my clients seem to have done this already. But I recreated what I thought were going to be the world's slowest head tags. Now, if you've got your phones handy, you might want to take a picture of a couple of slides. This next slide, you might want to take a photograph of it, just so you've got a reference while I'm speaking sort of the rest of the talk. This is the head tag I kind of came up with. There is 41 lines of HTML there, and most of them are empty space, right? So there's like maybe 30, 35 lines of HTML. We've got style sheets. We've got a bit of inline script. We've got a content security policy. We've got a cross-site request forgery token. This is all normal stuff that you would expect to see in head tags, right? Sure, it's a bit messy, and the white space isn't as nice as it could be, but nothing in here should be alarming. I would hope nothing in here is particularly alarming. This is an absolute tram smash. This is such a mess. I spend a lot of time, in case you haven't noticed, I spend a lot of time looking at head tags. And immediately here, there's a bunch of anti-patterns. So I want you to take a look at this and see if you can spot them as well. But this simple, innocuous-looking bit of HTML, once you run it through web page tests and grab a waterfall, that's what it looks like. Anyone who's used to reading waterfall charts, sorry, <laughs> it's a gross things to look at, uh, but what a mess. You wouldn't expect something this disastrous. You wouldn't expect some... For anyone who's not used to seeing waterfall charts, probably wonder why I'm being so dramatic. <laughs> But this is a real, real mess from those simple few lines of HTML. In fact, this is such a mess, it took us 9.3 seconds to start rendering the page. 41 lines of HTML took us 9.3 seconds. What we're going to do during this talk is refactor this. We're not going to rebuild an application. We're not going to switch from client-side rendering to server-side rendering. We're doing nothing complicated. All we're going to do in this talk is nudge some lines of HTML around and see if we can get this number any better. So the first bit of advice is don't be so big-headed. If it doesn't need to be in there, get it out. Right? If you can move it out of the head, do so. And not everything can be moved out of the head tags, but a lot of stuff can. Horrible, nasty sort of like your Facebook retargeting trackers, that, that kind of stuff, all that junk. That will work just as fine if you put it near the closing body tag. You need to use your, use your judgment here, but if you can get it out of the head, you absolutely should do. So if it doesn't need to be there, get it out. Look for any inefficiencies in your head tags. I'm talking things like um, any redirects or uh, any CSS that doesn't need to be in the head. You can put CSS files. You can put link rel equal style sheet in the body tags now. Every browser supports that, and it immediately unblocks rendering. I won't go into too much detail here, but that's a thing you can do nowadays. Reduce the amount of stuff in the head in terms of um, don't use all of Bootstrap if you're just needing its grid system, right? So reduce the size of payloads in the head. If you can get it out of there, you absolutely should. So one example in my demo of something we could remove from the head is this redirect. We've got a really annoying redirect here. 
You're probably thinking, Harry, come on, I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to put a redirect in. I'm not going to have a redirect in my head tags. No one would do that. I see it surprisingly frequently, and I see it because of things normally like this. People linking to um, a third-party CDN for like a, a certain package, in this case jQuery, and you just point at latest or at three. And this will resolve to an actual version number. So what we saw here is this, this redirect, um, that was 400 and... You know, it's 500 milliseconds. It's half a second. In fact, just to give context for people who aren't quite as boring as me, 500 milliseconds doesn't seem like a lot, a much, right? It doesn't seem like a lot. I was speaking with uh, John just before, the, uh, before I got on stage. I worked with a client in the UK about four years ago, and together we worked out that if we could make their website 300 milliseconds faster, just 300, they would make an extra 8 million pounds a year. So if I can get rid of, oh, by the way, pro tip, if I can find them 500 milliseconds just by removing a redirect, that's great, right? Never tell your clients what you do for them. I can't, I can't submit an invoice which is, oh, I linked to the correct jQuery and you owe me five grand, never gonna wash. What you do is your invoice says, I found you eight million pounds a year, so I'll take my slice. <laughs> now, what is interesting here is that we can see on this graph that that, that says 492 milliseconds. We, we got rid of this. Stands to reason we should have gained 492 milliseconds back. Web performance is slightly non-deterministic, and when you run tests, you are subject to, or you're, you're sort of susceptible to variance in testing, or variation in testing. So across like an average of five runs, even though this clearly says 492, realistically it only ended up being 41 milliseconds faster, which is odd, but that's what the numbers said, uh, said and I have to kind of trust the numbers. The next one is self-host whatever you can. Now, I'm starting real basic here. I'm starting with real basic advice, but a lot of my clients, they do miss this stuff. So it means my first couple of hours working for them, I look like a hero, and it takes me a couple of minutes. We're going to get into the technical, tricky stuff next. But this is another really basic one. Don't use somebody else's CDN, period. Don't link to ajax.googleapis for your jQuery. Don't use code.jQuery. Don't use... Even Google Fonts don't link out to anybody else for a third-party asset. Just don't do it. I'm not going to go in, into any detail because I don't really have the time. Um, but if you're interested, I've written a full article detailing the dangers of using somebody else's infrastructure. And you can grab that and sort of read that another time. So what I did now is I just self-hosted a couple of things. These files were all on a third-party domain. I've now proxied them through the same domain. And now we can see that we're saving a bunch of time here. Simply self-hosting these files, and the only reason, by the way, that people don't self-host their files, the only reason people do use code.jQuery is because people believe it to be faster. Not using a third party, 377 milliseconds quicker. It's much faster to self-host your own files. So what we've got now is a cumulative improvement of 418 milliseconds, which, like I said, to the right client, could be worth millions of euro a year. This next one's quite interesting. Get your head checked out. I'm old enough that I remember XHTML 2.0, and I remember validating my XHTML fastidiously. I was so obsessed with validating my HTML. No one's used the W3 validator for about eight years. I'm certain of it. Of course you haven't. Everyone's laughing. Like, you haven't even heard of it. That's how much we don't use it. However, I, I'm the one guy who still uses the validator because What's really interesting is invalid head tags can cause real problems. In the demo that I showed you, the sort of snippet of code, we had this cross-site request forgery token. This is a pretty common way of doing it in a hidden input. The problem is inputs aren't allowed in your head tags. They're an invalid element. In fact, there are only very few elements you are allowed to have in the head. Any element that isn't on this list will throw an error in browsers, and browsers will correct in real time. They're very clever and very forgiving, but the problem is, if the browser finds an input in the head tags, it panics and thinks, you're not allowed an input in the head. I must be in the body, and it will, on the fly, terminate the head early. So actually, in the browser, the DOM is rendered like this. All of those other head tag elements, the HTTP equiv meta, this style block, this, uh, this input, they're all pushed into the body. This has ramifications when it comes to browser scheduling, prioritization, resource prioritization, and can cause genuine problems when it comes to parsing and requesting files. Interestingly, just fixing this, um, fixing this 
HTML error um, didn't really yield too much of a change. Well, in fact, it kind of did. I need to get my head straight here, because that was very contradictory. What I'm trying to say is, I did not get the outcome I expected. A file went missing. We had one fewer request. I fixed these invalid head tags, and we lost a request. Um, I was like, oh, that's odd. And I didn't delete something by accident. It genuinely went missing, and it made me realize that something we're going to look at later in the talk had a really interesting knock-on effect. What's annoying, because this is weird, what's annoying is, I got slower. <laughs> so what I'm not suggesting is you go and just break your head tags and get a faster website. Even as a performance engineer, I would always prefer to have predictable, correct code that's a little bit slower than code that could be non-deterministic, depends how the browser handles it, et cetera, et cetera. So actually, we got 140 milliseconds slower for a cumulative improvement of just 280 at this point. OK, definitely get your phones ready now. Um, this entire talk hinges around this next slide. I've done a lot of research for the last three years, working out the absolute perfect order for your head tags. And it ended up just being one slide out of, out of 107 slides. The most important one is just one that I'm going to cover really quickly. So get ready to take a picture. This is the optimum head tag order. That little asterisk there is to remind me to tell you that this is subject to change, right? As in, Things may change in browsers in future. This is the current best sort of order based on all of my extensive testing. Um, but there will be caveats and implementation details where on your site, you might not be able to just simply replicate this. But here is the optimum head tag order. For the rest of this talk, we are only going to discuss the things in bright white. Everything that's dimmed out is, um, is not a scope of discussion for this talk. That's because everything that is grayed out is asynchronous. It will not block rendering anyway. So it's kind of moot. It's kind of irrelevant where you put these things in gray, um, for the purposes of this talk, at least. But everything that's in bright white is going to be something that's really important to sort of rendering the page. This is the optimum head tag order. Now, I'm around the next couple of days. If anyone wants to know anything about the things that are grayed out, come and find me. We'll grab a coffee, and I can tell you all about that. But like I say, for the purposes of this talk, all we really care about are the things that are render blocking. The first thing that I found um, is a really interesting, it's not quite a bug, but the first thing I found when I was researching this is um, if you've got a content security policy, meta CSP, if you've got a CSP defined as a meta tag, there's a chance you're going to run into huge problems. So anyone who's implemented CSP before, content security policy, it's a complete pain in the ass. It's a real nightmare. It's a horrible thing to implement. But normally, if you implement CSP, content security policies, you would do it with an, you'd do it with an HTTP response header. That's the sort of most normal way of doing it. For those who haven't heard of CSP, don't bother looking it up. It's dreadful. Uh, but it basically tells the browser what kind of files it is allowed to download from which specific domains. So it's a security thing. You can implement CSP in a meta tag in the head, but if you do, it's going to disable the preload scanner. I can't really see that well, but put your hands up if you have heard of the preload scanner. There's my five friends. <laughs> For those of you who haven't, this is a feature present in every single browser. Um, basically, in the olden days, i.e. 7, browsers were really slow at downloading things because they only had one parser. There was one engine that was responsible for parsing the HTML, discovering files, downloading files, executing the files, and then moving on, sort of rinse and repeat over and over. But it means there's lots of starting and stopping, because if the browser builds a bit of HTML and then discovers that it's a script tag and there's a script elsewhere, it has to stop, download the script, run it, and then proceed. Really, really, really slow. So in IE8, thanks Microsoft, who would have thought, oh, actually, because it was Microsoft, they actually called it the speculative pre-parser, because I guess enterprise. Everyone else calls it the preload scanner. The preload scanner is a secondary inert parser that's allowed to just run ahead and just do downloads. It's asynchronous, and that is what makes browsers as fast as they are. In fact, it made the web, in general, around 20% faster. Just this one invention that is inside a browser. Developers get it for free. The reason you've never heard of it is because it's just always there. It's just always working. If you put a meta CSP in the middle of your head tags, Chrome will disable the preload scanner. Um, so anyway, any browser that doesn't have a preload scanner, basically this is what IE7 used to look like, 
That would be the process of downloading four JavaScript files. It has to happen one after the other. And you can see, you can see how this is slow. Everything's dragged out, very serialized. Simply by inventing a preload scanner, IE8 moved us to a model a little more like this. Everything done in parallel. You can see how much faster that is. Way nicer. So I was working for a client, uh, and this client was really kind of getting stressed out. They were like, Harry, we've got real big problems with first content for paint. Start render is really, really bad. It's really slow. But we can't work out why. We're, we're, we've increased our spend with Cloudflare. We've got the most expensive hosting we can get. They were spending tens of thousands of dollars on this problem. And I was like, well, if it's a start render problem, it's almost always going to be in the head, right? Because the head is the biggest render blocking part of the page. So I ran a, a web page test. You can all see that, right? I've never seen a waterfall chart start with once upon a time before. <laughs> but this is a fucking tail. Let's zoom in. I isolated this client's head tags, and it's a real mess. You can see that generally here, the first sort of 10 files are downloading in parallel. Then we get this horribly dragged out sort of middle part of the, the chart. And then towards the end here, sort of the line 30 onwards, we start getting loads of stuff in parallel again. Something in, well, there's obviously something wrong in the head, right? Something is blocking rendering. Now, these little colorful, like, green, orange, and purple bits, this tells us that we are going to a different domain. A third party, right, is where this file lives. So I thought, well, I need to rule out, is this a first party problem or a third party problem? So I reran the test, blocking all third parties, and the problem became even more apparent. You can see there's this real stepped part of, if sort of in the middle here, sort of line 10 onwards, clearly step, step, step. This is very unusual. And like I say, I'm old enough that I'm like, I've seen this before. I've seen this in IE7, right? That's a, that's a flashback that nobody wants. So I was like, well, there's clearly something going on that's blocking the preload scanner, breaking the preload scanner. So it was a case of a, it was a manual job. I just had to go and look through the head tags line by line and look for anything unusual. The only thing that stuck out to me was this. An HTTP header equivalent meta tag that defined the content security policy. And remember, CSP tells the browser what files it is allowed to download and what it isn't from certain different domains. In this case, uh, it was just upgrading secure requests. But um, it turns out this being in the middle of the head tags disables the preload scanner. And it does it on purpose. Because here is the source code for Chromium's preload scanner. And it says here, don't preload anything if a CSP meta tag is found. It makes complete sense when you think about it. If the browser finds a policy that says, oh, be careful what you download from where, downloading will take longer, because it has to basically, if you've got a load of files and then your security policy, the browser's going to panic. And that's the problem. And also what it says here is, um, we should rarely find them here because blah, 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 blah. We should rarely find them. So I spoke to a friend who's much cleverer than I am. Most of my friends are much cleverer than I am. And I asked him to query the HTTP archive and find out just how many web pages, not websites, but individual web pages this affects. And it was actually a really small number. Eight and a half thousand, right? That was it, web pages, not even websites. This is rare. So it's the chance it affects anyone in this room is very, very, very slim. But I moved this line of HTML to the top of the head tags rather than the middle of the head tags, and we saw a tremendous change. In our demo case, in our demo case, uh, we saved this much time. So the other interesting thing is, one, the preload scanner does get disabled, so things download one after the other. But if the preload scanner is disabled for this meta CSP, you also get double downloads. This is also part of the reason why fixing the head tags made one request disappear. There were too many requests in this waterfall to start with. And the reason we had double downloads is, if the browser has started downloading a bunch of stuff and then finds a content security policy, it's got to re-download those files again with the new information. Because remember, remember, HTML is parsed line by line. So if you've told the browser, hey, go and download these files, and then the browser finds out, ah, oh, shit, I should have probably requested those a bit differently, it's going to go back and start all over again. So the two sort of fold problem here is that you lose the preload scanner, which means slow. But also, you will incur double downloads because the browser has to re-request those potentially insecure files. Just moving this one line of HTML to the top of the head tags saved us 3.7 seconds. Just moving one line of HTML. Again, never tell your clients what you did. 
Tell them the outcomes of what you did. We're now about four seconds faster, basically for free. We've just nudged a few lines of HTML around. This is specifically about the CSP meta tag. And the next thing I want to talk about is metadata in general. Um, so basically, the next thing in your head should be general metadata about the page. When I'm talking about meta here, these two asterisks are to remind me to tell you that I'm not talking about your Twitter open graph stuff or your um, sort of manifest file. All those meta tags that are for your SEO team and your marketing team, those don't count here. What I'm talking about is metadata about the page. How should the browser treat that page? So tell the browser how to deal with the page immediately. Make sure the browser understands what character encoding it should be using. Should it be rendering a zoomable page or not? What is the meta viewport? In fact, the spec even tells us, the spec outlines quite clearly, your character encoding should appear in the first kilobyte of the document. And that's not the first compressed kilobyte, that's the first kilobyte decompressed. The spec says it needs to appear that soon, because if not, remember HTML's parsed line by line, the browser's going to start parsing the page in the browser's character encoding. That's usually UTF-8. But if halfway down the page, there's a character encoding that says, no, this is ANSI for some reason, the browser's going to have to reparse the entire page as a brand new character encoding. So that's going to basically double up the parsing workload. But here's a pointless little demo I made. Here's what happens if you put your meta viewport at the bottom of the page. Page renders as a zoomed out desktop kind of view, and then, because HTML's parsed line by line, then it finds your meta viewport, it has to re-render the entire page. So it doesn't have to re-parse it, but it will have to repaint it. I'll play that again. I don't know why, it's not a particularly interesting video. I don't know why I'm playing it again, but I've committed to it now. If you put your meta viewport tag in the wrong place, you're going to render the page as a zoomed out desktop version, then the browser finds it, and then has to repaint the whole thing responsively. So basically, yeah, anything to do with how the browser deals with the page, get that very, very early in the head. Don't hide the title. This is an interesting one that has affected a couple of my clients, um, usually with um, like Optimizely or any A-B testing tools that kind of block the parser for quite a long time. They end up hiding their title of the page from their visitors. And oftentimes, the title is a visitor's very first impression of that web page or that website. So what I'm talking about here is HTML's parsed line by line. I can't remember if I've mentioned that yet. HTML's parsed line by line. So if line three is going to take a second, we don't even know if there is a line four. Therefore, we can't put a title in the browser's, like, browser tab, right? So, for example, what could happen is, watch this, look at the tab. That just says the current URL. This site looks down to me, right? We'll do that again. Literally just says the URL of the page. No actual feedback there. This looks broken. If I take this snippet and just swap those two around, look at the browser's title tab again. At least we can immediately tell the user, this page has responded, you've got a title, we can't render it yet, but the page is working and we're in the right place. So don't put anything parser blocking, don't put anything blocking at all ahead of your title, because you risk this happening, obscuring that information. Basically, what you don't want to do is have the title of the page the same as your start render. There's no reason those two should be the same number. You should show the title as soon as you can. Now, moving metadata around didn't change the shape of the waterfall at all, because we're not dealing with files at this point. We haven't moved any files. So the waterfall, the before and after, are visually identical. However, and this really, really surprised me, that change was 280 milliseconds faster, which really surprised me, because all I did is move some meta tags around. When I did these tests, by the way, I ran five tests every time and then sort of averaged it. So it wasn't like uh, none of the tests were anomalous. There wasn't any erroneous data. Like I, I did my due diligence and I did this properly. So once, you've took the, once I took the median of five tests, it was 280 milliseconds faster. This really surprised me, just moving metadata around. Okay, now we're about to get onto the good stuff. This is all about how your JavaScript and CSS interact with each other and how important it is that we get that correct. There's some really fascinating things about browser internals, but sincerely, I've, I've met very few developers who actually knew this stuff. Uh, it doesn't really get taught. It's not very obvious. You can't really see it happening. But once you're aware of it, it's going to really it'll keep you up at night. 
Synchronous JavaScript needs to go before CSS. People hate this. People think, well, CSS is render blocking, so I should put that first, right? That should be the first thing in front of the browser. Absolutely not the case. In the optimum head tag order, your synchronous JavaScript goes before your synchronous CSS. That's because CSS blocks execution of JavaScript. Any CSS will block the execution of any subsequent JavaScript. Pe most people I've met had no idea this was true. But your browser will not run any JavaScript if, you're, if it's currently downloading any CSS. There's a really simple reason for this, and it's a really annoying reason. It's a defensive strategy. Basically, the browser needs to defend itself 1% of the time, but this happens 100% of the time. And it's to get around the following problem. Here we've got a style sheet, style.css. Then immediately after it, we get computed style, we get the color of the page. A browser doesn't know what a script is going to do until it's doing it. So the browser doesn't know if this script tag is going to ask a CSS question or not. So if the browser did this asynchronously, that script will probably run before the CSS is downloaded. You're going to get a stale or incorrect answer. It'll just tell you oh, the page is black, because there's no styles applied to it yet. The browser doesn't know what this script is going to do, and that script could ask a CSS question. So defensively, the browser will not run that script until it's got all the CSS and worked out the CSS object model just in case the script asks a CSS question. So very unlikely your script will need to do this, but the browser will defensively carry this out every single time. A browser will not run any JavaScript if it is currently working on CSS. This is an example for example's sake. Where it does become a little more interesting is um, I'm getting double clicks, and it's really annoying me. Uh, examples such as this. Um, we've got here lines 7 through 11. We've got a little async snippet. Loads of third parties give you snippets like this to implement analytics or whatever it might be. You've seen these loads of times. Now, that script isn't going to run until this CSS is finished. So if that CSS takes half a second to download, that means the browser has got to wait half a second before it will even run this script. The way that manifests itself is analytics.js doesn't even get discovered so line three doesn't even get discovered until the moment line two is finished. This is complete serialization. We've lost the chance to parallelize anything here. That script wasn't allowed to run until that CSS is finished. What you do here is you just swap them around. Now I'm getting zero clicks. Um, what you do is you just swap these around. Very poignant that eight years later in the same room, this thing finally dies. Um, Swap these two around, right? Put your script first, and we get complete parallelization. Those now happen at the exact same time, way faster. Here's a thing that a lot of people don't know as well. These snippets, this snippet that's now sort of line three, any JavaScript that is injected, by definition, will be asynchronous. That's what the spec says. This is why we use these snippets. Injected JavaScript files are non-blocking. So what's interesting here is, this hasn't changed first contentful paint. We haven't unblocked rendering here, because regardless, this JavaScript wasn't blocking rendering. But what we have done here is we can run the JavaScript earlier. That means if it is an analytics package, we can capture the data sooner. If it provides functionality to the page, that functionality is available sooner. If it's an A-B testing tool, we can run the test hopefully before the user sees it happen. So this hasn't improved start render, but what it has done is it's given us access to the JavaScript's functionality in parallel with the CSS. Now, when, um, when you install Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager, it actually says here, place this script at the very top of the head. And most developers, because we're, we're good people for the most part, um, most developers think, piss off. I'm not putting you at the top of my head. I'm putting you at the bottom. Tag Manager isn't telling you to do this for nefarious, like, oh, we can capture more data that way. It's just that it's genuinely faster. Place synchronous JavaScript ahead of synchronous CSS, except this is where it gets weird. It turns out there is a, it depends, it's a bug or a feature depending on how lazy you're feeling. I, I think it's a bug. Chrome developers think it's a feature, which means they don't need to fix it. Um, synchronous JavaScript is blocked by CSS that contains imports. This is so weird. The little dagger is to remind me to tell you that don't use at import anyway. It's a terrible idea. Don't use import in CSS. Just, just don't. But if you've got a third party such as, um, I think my font, maybe Typekit, they force you to use at import, which is unfortunate. 
But if you've got a third party that forces you to use import, what you need to do is make sure your synchronous JavaScript goes after that import. Um, so basically, here we've got a synchronous JavaScript file, and the CSS file defined after it simply at import another one. Running this through web page test gives us a really, really interesting phenomenon. Line two was responsible for discovering and downloading line four. Line two is a CSS file that simply contains an at import. But look at the gap. Look at the gap here. That's incredible. For some reason, that, that second style sheet wasn't even discovered until the moment the JavaScript had finished. The reason for this is fascinating. Browsers are single threaded. They can only do one thing at once. So what this means is it downloads a style sheet, then immediately starts downloading a JavaScript file, and it's like, well, I'm in the scripting phase of the sort of, that sort of frame life cycle is script and then style with bits in between. What happens is the browser downloads a CSS file and then immediately has a JavaScript file, and it's like, well, this is a synchronous file, I've got to run it. In order to run that JavaScript file, it's got to wait till it downloads. But here's the thing. In order to discover the import, the browser also has to do a recalc style, and that's the style phase of the frame. I'm, this is way too much to just verbalize. I should probably have a slide that explains this. But basically, the browser needs to do a recalc style on that first style sheet to even discover the at import. But it can't do a recalc style until it's finished its scripting task. So this is a really strange phenomenon where the browser can't discover the import until it's finished working on this JavaScript. They are completely unrelated. Now, the Chrome team had no idea this existed. I did raise a bug, and they're, like I say, they're of the opinion that it's too much work to fix. It's a feature. Basically, you take this, and we, we're back. We take this, we swap them around, and the waterfall chart now looks a lot more like this. Way faster, way, way faster. Avoid import anyway, just don't do it, but if you have to, make sure your uh, CSS goes before <laughs> the JavaScript. Um, that's actually helped me prove a point, because I don't expect you to memorize this. I've got a cheat sheet for you later. Um, here is the Vans Canada website. And what's really interesting, their start render isn't until 15 seconds. That's terrifying, 15 seconds. The Vans website is a bit of a car crash, um, unfortunately. And their head tag has got like over 100, like 144 files in their head tags. It's a, it's a real, do you know what? This isn't really their fault. It's because Next.js is really overzealous with preloading. So they made loads of tiny little bundles. Then Next.js goes and just preloads them all. So the head tags for the Vans Canada website are enormous. But see this, this JavaScript file on line 142? Um, that needs to run, then it downloads the next one. And that CSS file is blocked behind that really long JavaScript. That's because that CSS file is at imported. So basically, this last render blocking file, this CSS file on line 144, that last render blocking file, is for some reason trapped for nearly 13 seconds behind this slow loading JavaScript. If they move that CSS before the JavaScript, Completely solved the problem. That's all they need to do. I should probably email them about this rather than tell you lot. I didn't work for Vans. I just noticed that someone said the site felt slow, and I was like, oh, that's why. I should probably let them know. I did raise a bug. It's, it, bah, it's probably not going to get fixed. So just reordering synchronous CSS after synchronous JavaScript and imports before JavaScript, reordering this stuff, just moving lines around, the waterfall now looked like this. That huge bit of inline script is now defined before the CSS files. So if you look on line one at the top, that script doesn't run until about four seconds. Now it runs as soon as the HTMLs arrived. Right? It's about three and a half seconds faster to run that inline script because it isn't being blocked by any of the CSS anymore. Just reordering these files, we find that um, we save 1.6 seconds just by reordering CSS and JavaScript. And then, because I keep saying it, don't use import. Just don't use it. So I just got rid of the import and used a second link rel equal style sheet in the head. Basically, I added one more link rel equal style sheet tag and removed the import from the CSS file. We then got to this, where now we don't have to wait for the CSS to be parsed before we can discover that last file. And just doing that, just removing an import, saved us 750 milliseconds, three quarters of a second just by removing an import. What I find fascinating here is we haven't rebuilt the application. We haven't fundamentally changed how the site works. We haven't replatformed. 
We've just nudged some files around, and at this point, we're 6.6 .6 seconds faster just by nudging some lines around. Um, for anyone who does work in SEO or the marketing department, or for anyone here worried about what the marketing department's going to tell you, I am going to address that issue. Just put your SEO and social stuff, put that at the end of the head. Just put it at the end. It's going to work. It's going to be fine. Because here's how I explain it to SEO people. SEO people say, no, no, if we put it too low down, Google bot might not find it. It might not find that data. And remember, HTML is parsed line by line. HTML is parsed line by line. What this means is, if Googlebot can't find the bottom of your head tags, it can't find the start of your body tags, which means your pages aren't getting indexed anyway. If you think about it logically, if your SEO manager is worried that, oh, what if Googlebot doesn't make it to the bottom of the head, they should be double terrified that it therefore hasn't made it to the start of the body. <laughs> and you're proper fucked. So basically, um, if Googlebot can't find your meta tags, it can't find your content. There is one really interesting sort of almost exception. I tweeted about this, um, and my friend, again, it's the same friend from earlier, the friend that's cleverer than me, a guy called Barry, he did some quick tests. You know when you tweet something and you get like the card, the, the open graph card that shows like a, the title and a, a brief description of the URL, or in iMessage, you drop a message to a friend and it'll show you a little like snippet of the web page you've sent them. Most services do a full get request. It will download the entire HTML of that link you've sent your friend, uh, and it will just look through the whole HTML for the relevant meta tags. The only exceptions are WhatsApp, which gets the first megabyte of the HTML, and it will look in the first megabyte of HTML for those meta tags. This is compressed HTML as well. So if you've got a compressed page more than a megabyte, then the last thing you need to worry about is WhatsApp. Slack does a range request also, but it just gets the first 32 kilobytes of compressed HTML. But again, if your head tags are bigger than 32 compressed kilobytes, don't be worried about what people see in Slack. Be worried about how people experience your website for real. So the only exceptions are Slack and WhatsApp, but they're not really, they're not relevant because there is no way your head tags will be bigger than 32 compressed kilobytes. It's just not going to happen until it does. Uh, Slack actually says this. Um, it fetches as little of the page as it can using a range request. Um, so Slack, they, this is a very deliberate thing from them. Oh, I've only got three minutes left and quite a lot still to cover. So um, basically, a new order. I rewrote this HTML. We, we rewrote this HTML this morning. And now it looks like, well, now first contentful paint is 2.7 seconds. It was 9.3. It's now 2.6. It could get a lot faster as well, but what I actually did for my demos is I made sure that every single file took one second to download, just to exaggerate the waterfalls for you. So it's not actually 2.6 seconds. Realistically, it would be much faster. Um, but yeah, a fair test. I made sure every file took at least a second to download. The new order is this. Synchronous, well, metadata first, then the title, then all of my synchronous JavaScript, then all of my synchronous CSS, uh, and, and that's it. That's the new order. There, there were no social meta tags in this example, but they'd be very last. Uh, this is an ugly slide. I should have deleted this. But that's just a diff. If you want to actually look at the slides online, you can actually see what I changed. But the key thing is, let's look at the before and after of the waterfalls. So the waterfalls on the same time frame, the same x-axis, very, very different beasts now. It's just from moving a few lines of HTML around. Um, now, this is a really boring slide, and it's going to take about nine seconds. Oh, this is, I'm bored of this. I'm so sorry I'm doing this to you. That was very boring. But you see, we're fully rendered. We're finished at 2.8 seconds. The other one, 9.4, right? Vast difference. All right. Um, I started this talk with a bit of like a, I don't know, pretentious talk about medical history, which you can tell I hadn't researched that well. I want to go back to a bit of medical science now. Com computed tomography, or CT scans. Whenever I'm doing this work for clients, it's just a lot of stuff for me to memorize. It's a lot of stuff I have to just remember and look out for. And I, I, I started thinking a few months ago, like, it'd be great to have a little tool that could just do this for me. I'd like to just have a quick look inside someone's head. Well, the way we do that for people is with a CT scan, right? So I was thinking, well, why don't I try and build a CT scanner for, for web pages? And because um, I'm a bit of a fool, I thought, well, I'm going to build it in CSS. Right? What, what, what's the most inappropriate language syntax for this job? It's CSS. So I, that's what I did. 
And I created a little snippet called ct.css that you can just install into your app. It's actually a browser bookmarklet. Anyone use those anymore? And you can just go to any web page, click this thing, and it will show you this. And this, uh, this is the test page, and it will show you, hey, look, this inline script is completely fine. It's, it's an inline script. There's no network request, and it's nice and early. Um, async attribute is redundant, blah, blah, blah. And it will just show you loads of ANSI patterns and stuff that might be incorrect with, with your head tags. The color of the borders hi highlights severity. So red is like, this is a problem. Uh, if the border is solid, it means this file is the file we're talking about. If the border is dotted, it's saying that another file is causing this file problems. So you can basically work out, is this file being blocked or is this file blocking? Um, this was... Um, well, this is like calling someone your ex's name by accident, because this is actually for a different conference website. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this is, I did a workshop at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and this is what their head tags look like. Uh, CNN, the CNN website, uh, broke the tool, so that's very on brand. Everyone dumps all over CNN. It's horrible. Everyone talks about how bad CNN is. But CNN clearly don't send staff to conferences, because if they did, CNN would have the fastest website. It's in every demo. If they just went to conferences, people are fixing CNN for free. Um, if you want to use this, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, just include the style sheet. You can hotlink it. Um, obviously, that's going to be a messy in your development environment. Um, you can create a browser bookmarklet, basically. If you just save this as a bookmark in your browser, you can just create a little, bless you, create a little bookmark, and it will just work on the fly for any page you visit. If you want to see it and its source code, it's right there. Um, it's, it's fairly useful, it's not foolproof, it's not bulletproof, but it's a really great starting point for just quickly trying to work out where your liabilities are. You don't have to memorize all this stuff. What a waste of your time. I just spent 45 minutes telling you, don't remember anything I said, just use this. <laughs> but you have been very patient, and it has been 45 minutes, and I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you.